the Lord among us or not? That's what the Israelites wanted to know as they're in the wilderness and they are thirsty and they have had no water and they see nothing around them except for dry, cracked rocks and sand and nothing that would indicate that they will receive any refreshment for their parched lips. Do you remember the last time you were really thirsty? Really thirsty. What does it feel like to be really thirsty? You might remember, what does it feel like? What does it feel like in your body? What goes through your mind when you're really thirsty? Cotton mouth. Cotton mouth, yes. You just feel like you can't talk, your tongue is all gummed up. Good. How else, what do you feel when you're really, really thirsty? No one's ever been really, really thirsty? Yeah, Rachel? Yeah, she said, you feel like your whole body is dried out, like you're a wilting plant, like you can't get anything in you to, to perk you up. How else does it feel, Benjamin? Yeah, your, your throat starts to feel dry, and you just feel like your whole body is crying out for this water. That's how the Israelites felt. And they were starting to get panicky, because here they were in the desert, and there seemed to be no relief in sight. Now, for those of you who are just with us this Sunday, just to give you a little backstory, we've been preaching through, as I said at the beginning of the service, we've been preaching through the book of Exodus. And in Exodus, we have the story of Moses, who was, as a baby, in the basket on the Nile River, rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. He grew up to lead the people of Israel out of slavery and into the freedom that would come to them eventually in the Promised Land. But it's a long journey full of fear and trepidation and moments of panic like this when you worry when you're worried, is God among us or not? Now, they've had plenty of evidence to show them that, yes, God is there. When they were escaping from the Egyptian army, God parted the waters of the sea so that they could cross on dry ground. God wiped away the army that was chasing them. When they were, last week we talked about when they were in the desert and they were hungry, there was no food. And what did God send to them? Anybody remember? Manna. Manna. That was their bread. We talked about communion last week. How that little piece of bread sustains us for the journey. But now, it's not just food. It's the very basic thing that they need, water. I teach a class on religious studies, and I ask my students as a as a, they, for, they, for them to do a fasting exercise where they refrain from food for 24 hours. Some of them get a little panicked about this, but then I tell them, you can at least have water. And they're like, oh, okay, we can live without food for 24 hours, but living without water would be very, very difficult. The body just can't go that long without water. So there they are in the desert. And they, the Israelites are wondering, what has God done to them? What has Moses done to them, leading this, them this far into the wilderness with no hope in sight? Is God among us or not? I have to admit, I've been asking that question myself, given the events that have been going on in our world and in our congregation the last two weeks. In our world where we see so much violence, so much racial hatred, so much evil in the world, it feels like we're in a, a moral and ethical desert, and there doesn't seem to be any hope of refreshment in sight. And I worry, I worry so much about the world that I have brought my children into, and I ask God continually, are you among us or not? And I've been asking that with one of our parishioners who was struck down when his heart stopped working 
two weeks ago. His name is John Schaefer. He's our council president. He's only 44 years old. And out of the blue, he was at work, and his body just, his heart just stopped working. And it took six times of shocking his heart just to get it going again. And he's been in the hospital, and they've been working on him, trying to figure out what's wrong. And it looked for a very long time that he was not going to make it. And as I sat in that emergency waiting room with his wife, Jen, and their family, I was wondering, are you among us or not, God? And that's a hard place to be as a pastor when you're ministering to people and you yourself are having doubts. And believe me, pastors have doubts. So if you've ever doubted in your life whether God is there or not, don't be too hard on yourself because we all experience that. There are awful, terrible things that happen in this world, some things that we bring on our, ourselves, but some things that have absolutely no fault of our own. It's part of the human condition that sometimes tragedy strikes. And we ask this question, is God with us? Or are we really on our own? When God speaks to me, sometimes it comes in very subtle ways, and sometimes it comes in really big ways. And God spoke to me to say, I am here with you. Three times during the past two weeks when I have felt myself in this wilderness of doubt. The first time was when I was doing the baptismal conference. For Emily, what's she doing? What's that? Oh, she's eating. Okay. She's getting her sustenance in the wilderness. Good for her. <laughs> when I sat down with BJ and Christy, and we read through the story of Genesis, how God used water to birth this beautiful planet, and that same water has been with us all throughout the Earth's history. And these same drops that we will put over her head to baptize her may very well have been part of the water cycle that could have baptized Jesus himself. Because the same water that we have now is the same water that existed then. It's all part of that cycle. And I remembered how her story is washed in this planet story in Jesus' story, and all of our stories, I realized that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And that was a drop of blessing for me. And then I experienced another, really, a gushing blessing. I felt like Moses standing before the rock when I walked into John's hospital room. And he's, his eyes were open after 10 days of being virtually non-responsive. His eyes were open, he looked at me, he recognized me, and the tears started flowing. And while those tears indicate pain and suffering, it also meant he's alive. He is alive to be able to cry. That was like Moses striking the rock for me, just seeing those tears. And I was overwhelmed hearing him talk to me and share his pain, yes, and he's got a long road of recovery ahead of him. But I know that because of all of the prayers of this congregation and all of their friends and family and the work of the, the medical personnel and Jen so faithfully being by his side, God has indeed been with him and with us and will continue all that way. And the third time I experienced God's blessings this week came right up here on Friday night when we had our youth lock-in. 
our lock-in is like a, a, an overnight at the church. It's not like we put the kids in jail or anything, because sometimes people will think that that's what it is. And sometimes we wish we could do that, right, Felicia? Yeah? Sometimes that happens, right, Mike? We've had those moments, right? <laughs> they were, uh, and Kelsey, they were all with us as chaperones. But no, a lock-in, it's a, it's a sleepover. So we had a sleepover at the church. And we played games, and we had a good time. But the really profound moment came for me when we all sat up here, and we had candles on the altar. And we invited the youth to light a candle and say a prayer if they so chose. And the prayers that came out of their lips just washed me in hope and refreshment, realizing that from the time they were Emmeline's age, they had been steeped in the waters of faith and learning and baptism, and they are now blessing me with those drops of refreshment. They prayed for our world, they prayed for family members, they prayed for God to be revealed through the scripture. I mean, I could not believe the kinds of prayers that were coming out of these 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds. They were amazing. And it reminded me that yes, God is indeed among us. You yourself may have gone through a period of doubt asking that question, is God among us or not? I don't know where you are on your faith journey, but I welcome you on this day to feel those drops of blessing upon you. When you come up for communion, it's okay for you to reach your finger into the baptismal font and just make the sign of the cross on yourself. The same water that we will use to baptize you. I invite you when you come forward to receive communion and you hear those words, this is the body of Christ, this is the blood of Christ, for you, you, to hear in those words the answer to that question, is God among us or not? Absolutely, indeed, God is with you. And I invite you too to come to this prayer kneeler, or if you don't feel comfortable with kneeling, you can also stand, and voice your prayer concerns to Tammy or Ted. Articulate what you need. Just like the Israelites said to Moses, we are thirsty, we are dying, we need something here. <clears throat> Bring your prayers to the altar. Whether you're praying for yourself, if you've got surgery coming up, or you've got some kind of chronic condition in your body, or you want to stand in the gap, as the saying goes, for someone else who you know is struggling physically, emotionally, or spiritually, or you want to pray for our world, knowing all of the strife, all of the conflict that's going on, and you are asking for God to send blessing upon this world. You can do that too. And when you hear the prayers for you and you feel the healing oil on your forehead, take that into yourself as the drops of blessing that you need to reassure you when you are doubting and asking that question, is God among us or not? You can say, yes, God is here. God is among these faithful people. God is in that hospital room. God is at this font. God is in my hand. God is in my heart. And I share God's blessings with the world. Amen.